So now I want to talk about the Restoration. Often in the history of England, this is a period is just referred to as the Restoration. And um, what it means is the restoration of the monarchy. And that's kind of the, the nice way of putting it. But in reality, what happens is, is that it's the restoration of absolute monarchy. There is an attempt to make it a parliamentary monarchy uh, in the early days. But ultimately, uh, Charles II and James II um, rule by um, absolute power at certain times during their tenure. So with the dissolving of the long parliament, um, and, and we should notice uh, the timeline here, notice that the long parliament was called uh, for April uh, in February. So there was elections between February and April uh, and, and, uh, and well, these were returning members. Uh, I'm not sure if there were elections involved in that. Parliamentary uh, election procedure is very uh, convoluted. Um, <clears throat> but they meet in April. And uh, at the beginning of April, Charles II issues his declaration of Breda. Breda is a town in the Netherlands. Um, now, he had been in exile in the Spanish Netherlands, which Breda is not part of. Breda is in the north in the, in the Republic, the Dutch Republic. Um, he uh, originally signs his declaration as a, like an open letter from the Spanish Netherlands, but is advised to move to, to Breda and then issue the statement from there. Uh, that that put a better spin on things, and so he does that. Um, and, and you know, so Charles had been in exile uh, in a Catholic uh, stronghold within the Netherlands, and uh, you know, is thoroughly a Catholic and allied with the King of Spain, Philip, uh, and against the Republicans in the Dutch Republic, and of course against the Republicans in the protectorate and, and the Commonwealth in England. Uh, and he's a monarchist, he's a royalist, uh, and he believes in the divine right of kings. And you know, so we're back to the divine right of kings, uh, but uh, the Republicans in England are gonna try to constrain his power. So he issues this declaration of Breda and says that if he's reinstated as the monarch, he'll give a general par uh, pardon for rebels that had um, acted against him, uh, that uh, people who had gained proper property during the Commonwealth could retain that property. We're not going to try to sort out uh, the old property relationships, that there'll be religious toleration, and that he would guarantee back pay for the army because the the pay for the army is always in arrears. And, and of course, that's uh, very, uh, very troublesome when you have something that's a quasi -dic uh, military dictatorship, right? Um, so a convention parliament is called and a convention parliament is, is just a kind of free parliament where people rep uh, elect representatives to then form a new government. And um, the election favors uh, royalists. It seems that people were ready for a change. Um, and, and generally, the population was in favor of returning to monarchy because the protectorate had been, had been um, somewhat like a military dictatorship uh, living under it, even though it was constrained. Um, still there was a lot of abuses of, of power uh, going on and people were tired of it. And uh, so the convention parliament proclaims Charles the King on, on May 8th of 1660. Um, there's an act passed of a general par pardon and, and, and this, uh, you know, is worded very heavily so that so that it, even in the future, people, you know, there couldn't be an act 
past that would would call these people to account in the future as the the oblivion part um, and the ten years abolition act is passed now here we have uh, now we have something that looks like James's great proposal back at the early part of the century. Uh, the Tenures Abolition Act says an act for taking away the court of wards and liveries and tenures and capite and by night service and purveyance and for settling a revenue upon his majesty in lieu thereof. So that now they are doing what James wanted in the first place is that the monarchy gives up these traditional feudal rights of sort of arbitrary absolutism in exchange for a yearly uh, compensation in money in money form. So the last vestiges of, of some of the the uh, arbitrariness of the monarchy are, are wiped out with this act, okay, which certainly strain the monarch, especially from doing things like what uh, Charles the first did when he was uh, ruling absolutely in his personal rule for 11 years. He just began to, you know, resurrect old laws that, that had fallen out of, you know, hadn't been used and hadn't been applied in a long time and, and just manipulating uh, these traditional rights of the monarchy. Here, those things are ruled out. Uh, so that is a, a big correction to things. Um, sounds like a good idea. Let's not do the whole civil war all over again. Um, and then that convention parliament is dissolved uh, late that year. The army is largely demobilized. There is a standing army that's retained, but largely demobilized. And so this is just a, a list of general things that are going on uh, in England at the time. Uh, the population is low in comparison to what it was at the beginning of the century because of the civil wars and um, you know civil wars are very devastating to a population because it doesn't matter who dies on either side that's a reduction of your original population and so uh, there is a, a, a significant drop in population after the civil wars uh, going into the protectorate period and and that is that is still dragging on um, but we have these yeoman farmers. So this is where the, the kind of archetype of the yeoman farmer about is a lot of the new model army, uh, even lower ranking officers were rewarded with land holdings, small land holdings. And so these yeoman farmers are just um, are proprietor farmers, people who farm their own property but maybe have a large tract of land and, and maybe they're, uh, they're hiring laborers, but they're also working it themselves. Uh, you, you know, even if they're not working in the fields every day, they are managing it closely. And they're experimenting with capitalistic farming te techniques to try to get the labor out of their workers for a way, you know, they pay them a wage, but try to get, uh, you know, surplus value out of them and, um, turn that into larger and larger wealth. Uh, but the yeoman farmer is not um, a genuine bourgeoisie capitalist. The, the yeoman farmer is like an entrepreneur who's always struggling. Uh, and that's, that's not really the model of a, of a capitalist. Um, but, uh, but they, they do start to implement some very good farming strategies in agriculture. And there's an agricultural revolution that takes place because there is a lot of experimentation. And uh, these yeoman farmers are hands-on and really trying to squeeze as much out of it as they can. And they're struggling. And, um, 
And so there is an agricultural revolution so that agricultural produce begins to increase quite significantly uh, in this time period. And this is really where the old feudal ways of farming that the strips of land and people just subsistence farming and just, just farming enough to feed their family and then give a portion to the Lord. Um, and this, the whole idea of subsistence farming uh, gets eliminated. And now you have these farmers who are doing it in a more systematic and scientific fashion and trying to squeeze profit out of it, um, but not necessarily doing it successfully but doing a lot of experimentation, which then does lead to a lot of improvement in the quality and quantity of the, of the produce. So the nutrition going into the following decades is far superior than what the nutrition had been for centuries before. And we begin a long-term population explosion, um, largely because of this ag agricultural revolution. That, that's, um, you know, I, I, I point to this because this is very important in thinking about in our current day, the ecological cataclysm, because part of the ecological problem that we're facing in 2021 is a gigantic uh, population. The world population at this point is about uh, 1 billion people. And right now we are going over 8 billion people and and um, we're on a track to probably heat, hit 10 billion people by um, 2050 or 2075. And so that's a, a, a tenfold increase, 10 times, a thousand percent increase. And um, and that's, that's part of our problem with the ecology right now is that we just, there's too many people to sustain uh, that population over the long run. Unless we come up some, with something super creative and innovative, uh, but we haven't been able to do so, so far. This is the beginning of the population explosion. And then the techniques that are adopted in England begin to be adopted on the continent in Europe, spreads throughout Europe, and then eventually spreads all around the world. So it's a generalized phenomenon uh, for this first part. Now, there, there's another part to that story, which I will try to touch upon in later uh, lectures. Okay. Um, And I think I will, I will stop right here and then start a new video for the Cavalier um, Parliament.